is episode 172 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Organ Regeneration with Dr. Valentina Greco. Hey everyone, this is Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge in stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. Want links to all the papers discussed in each episode? Subscribe to our newsletter and you'll get a summary of each episode, including links to interview and roundup papers delivered straight to your inbox each time a new episode comes out. Today, we have Dr. Valentina Greco from Yale. She's on the podcast to talk about her research on tissue maintenance and regeneration in the skin. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights and stem cell news coming right up. But first, Stem Cell Technologies would like to introduce you to Dermal Cell News, covering everything from dermal stem cells and tissue regeneration to skin cancers and disorders. Dermal Cell News keeps readers current with the latest news, research policy events, and jobs relevant to the dermal cell community. Check out Dermal Cell News and the rest of Stem Cell's scientific newsletters at www.dermalcellnews.com. But we're going to start off with something that's not dermal cell, we're going to start off with obviously my favorite cell type, the cardiomyocyte, and a paper that I've seen go from the inception of the idea all the way to the publication in Cell Stem Cell. This is, to me, it's really exciting. The title of this paper is Wnt Activation and Reduced Cell-Cell Contact Synergistically Induces Massive Expansion of Functional Human iPSC-Derived Cardiomyocytes. This is coming from my former grad school lab, well, one of my former labs, and Sean Wu's lab over at Stanford University. It's two co-first authors here in Yan Boykema and Soa Lee, who are both in, in Sean Wu's labs. So to frame all of this, we know a little bit about cardiomyocytes, IPS cardiomyocytes, how they're powerful for modeling diseases in vitro and for drug screening as well. One issue is that since these cells are cardiomyocytes, they are terminally differentiated and it's really tough to get them to proliferate. All right, that's that's an issue with cardiomyocytes both in vitro and also in the body, right? And it's part of the reason that after a myocardial infarction, you have limited cardiac repair because cardiomyocytes don't proliferate. And this is an exciting paper because it's showing in vitro you can get a massive, massive expansion of iPS-derived cardiomyocytes without losing their functional capacities and contractility and all that simply by using two things. One is a small molecule that we all use during stem, in stem cell biology, CHEER 99021, to activate wind signaling. And two, also very important, is seeding the cells at the right density, and in particular, making sure that they're not contact inhibited, so seeding them at a very sparse density. All right, so let's walk through the paper. Um, first thing that really they were able to do was just to show that an early day of differentiation, day 12 of cardiomyocyte differentiation after you do your glucose purification to actually purify your IPS cardiomyocytes, if you hit these cells with cheer this uh, gsk3 beta inhibitor that i was talking about uh in after splitting the cells really harshly you can actually get them to reactivate their cell cycle and proliferate pretty pretty dramatically and this is something that can be carried over for multiple passages they actually show some pretty nifty uh images and i've actually seen some of the the cells over there in sean wu's incubators where they've got flasks and flasks of you know t75 uh, uh, T75 flasks full of cardiomyocytes that have all just started from an initial six well plate of cardiomyocytes. And this is really, I think, pretty revolutionary because now we're able to scale up cardiomyocyte production to a level that really hasn't been as feasible before. And the other thing that I think is really exciting is, you know me, man, I, I've said this again and again, I, as much as I like stem cell biology, I kind of hate the differentiation. I hate making these cells again and again because it's tedious, right? And so maybe this is a hope. This is, you get one good cardiac differentiation and then you can split them really hard, hit them with the cheer, make sure they're contact inhibited, in, inhibited and then you're off. You can scale your cardiomyocytes up like crazy up to your T75 flask or whatever. 
I think there are still a, a few questions to answer when it comes to this process, though. One is uh, some of the mechanisms behind that contact inhibition. They didn't flesh it out as much. It's, um, you know, it's actually one important thing to consider here. It's actually not looking into um, the YAP signaling pathway. YAP signaling and HIPPO signaling is one pathway that's thought to be really important for cardiomyocyte proliferation, but that's actually, that wasn't important here. It was really the contact inhibition, and they still have to do a lot more work when it comes to fleshing that out. But hey, man, this is something that's near and dear to, to my heart, pun intended. Um, I've seen this project go from the inception all the way to the, to the end, and honestly, I've got differentiations going right now, and I'm going to give this a shot. Yes, make your life a little bit easier. And I think as you're alluding to there, it's a necessary milestone toward scaling this up toward, you know, clinical industrial application. I think that's really what I think we're all trending towards here. It's we're beyond just the concepts now we're trying to lean into just technically getting this stuff to work. I guess, as you were also saying, there's some mechanistic elements left because, you know, just practically speaking, I wonder if it would make it easier if you didn't have to reseed them even, if you could um, just, you know, mediate that contact inhibition by some kind of molecular or pharmacological means. And also the idea of scaling into 3D, you know, when you talk about getting this into an industrial setting, everyone talks about these bioreactors to get to the scale of cells mm -hmm. you need. But you and I were talking before the show, I mean, just again, just pragmatically speaking, how many flasks do you need to get enough cardiomyocytes to be therapeutic, you know, like this is maybe something that could get us really into, into clinical trial, at least in the near term. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there's a figure here where they're saying they can scale a single six well all the way up to like six or seven T150 <sighs> flasks full of cardiomyocytes. And that's going to give you 10 billion cardiomyocytes, which is equivalent to the number of cardiomyocytes that's actually found in the adult human heart, right? So in terms of scalability, you know, who knows? Maybe you don't even need to go to that suspension-based approach unless, of course, you want to you wanna sell these things down the road. Well, we're not trying to make money here. Room. We're trying to, you know, <laughs> make lives a little bit better. Not you and I. Maybe you. Maybe me. But uh, I know who is for sure. That's Gordon Keller, um, you know, staying in the, in the heart. Uh, Gordon Keller has made famous by his work in uh, human pluripotent stem cells and cardiac differentiation. He's one of the uh, founders there. And um, also, not just, you know, when they say cardiac, there's also a vascular at the end of that. Cardiovascular, he's also really big in endothelial cells. And this is a story uh, from his lab at the McEwen Stem Cell Center in Toronto um, that was looking into the vasculature, in this case, specifically the vas vasculature of the liver, endothelial cells within the liver, okay? Why the liver? Because the liver actually has endothelial cells that are kind of specialized, uh, well, absolutely specialized relative to under endothe other endothelium. You know, all endothelium is special, but the liver in particular, um, it has multiple functions related to, you know, transport, of metabolic blood components and drugs uh, and scavenging and clearing of biomolecules from the blood and also secretion of factor eight, um, which is relevant for clotting. So the liver and the thelium has a lot of functions and it's really unique anatomically as well. You can tell the liver uh, and the thelium apart from other endothelium because it exhibits these fenestrations that are clear even by microscopy. Um, so there's not only molecular uh, criteria that distinguish them, but also anatomic structural criteria that actually mediate their function. And lastly, the liver in terms of like regenerative endothelium, there's this concept that was pioneered by my former mentor, Shaheen Rafi, about angiocrine. The angiocrine hypothesis being that different vascular beds in each organ provide some essential inductive factors that can mediate organ regeneration. And the liver endothelium is one of the first um, organ-specific vascular beds that was shown to have this function. So for many reasons, liver endothelium, these liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, or LSECs, as they've been called, have been long sought in the field of pluripotent stem cells. And Gordon Keller here has done it um, in his typical fashion, which is just grinding on the details here. And we won't go through all the methods. God knows it was 20 years in the making. But what they ultimately show is that it's a combination of hypoxia um, and cyclic AMP agonism, as well as transformer growth, transforming growth factor beta inhibition 
that specifically in venous endothelial cells can endow a kind of LSEC signature. Um, and the real, you know, the reason why this is a cell stem cell paper is not just because it's Gordon Keller at the end, but also because they really do the, all the nitty gritty functional work um, showing that they engraft in, in uh, neonatal mice and contribute to all, a lot of the liver vasculature and are retained. They also engraft into adult mice that robustly express factor eight. So they have that functional component and structurally, anatomically, they look you know, not just with markers where they show that they have live one and all this stuff, but they look and show that just structurally by electron microscopy, they also display these fenestrations and look identical to the bona fide um, adult liver endothelium. So on, on many fronts, these have been validated as l sex, And really the, the major import I think here is the, the functional in vivo work that they did both in neonates as well as in adult showing significant engraftment up to I think like 70, 80% of the endothelium within these um, livers was from uh, human pluripotent stem cell uh, l sex. So the whole idea of a humanized liver is really now right around the corner it seems which is gonna be really important for tox studies also for, you know, all kinds of industrial applications and therapeutic inquiry. So a big story from Gordon Keller, not surprising that he's, uh, you know, revolutionizing the field of endothelium and hum human pluripotent stem cells. Nice work. Yeah, good stuff from Gordon Keller, who's one of the pioneers when it comes to all things differentiation, not just cardiac, but all over the place, right? Uh, there are a few things that I really took from this. I mean, for one, you, you emphasized it. There are so many different types of endothelial cells out there, and you're an EC guy, right? So you can so I understand why you really love this paper. Uh, we're focusing on the liver sinusoidal endothelial cells here, and I'm, you know, I'm not an EC guy, but like to, I, I like to pretend that I am. So I make these CD31, CD144 positive ECs, and I call them vascular ECs, right? But I know there's way more to it than that. And we there's all these like single cell endothelial analysis papers that are coming out there that are showing that there's a lot of heterogene heterogeneity in endothelial cells across the body. It's not just a matter of making your dual CD31, 144 positive, positive cells and calling it a day, right? And so the, the, I think this is where this paper is pretty exciting because you're actually making a very specialized form of endothelial cells in these liver sinusoidal ECs. And the other thing that I thought was cool was um, the in, vi in vivo part of it, the fact that you can actually transplant these cells in vivo and actually get them to functionally mature in, in that way. I think that's, that's really powerful. And it's something that I think there is applicable to other cell types as well. So as an EC guy, does it bother you? Does it bother you that I'm calling my CD31, 144 <laughs> cells, vascular endothelial cells and calling it a day? Does it burn you to your core? Does it hurt you in your bones? Tell me about it, Dale. Talk, Ur about, talk about your feelings. I'm open. However you want to identify your endothelial cells or any of your cells, you, you can identify as you will. Okay. I'm very open. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, I, I observe the fact that it's, it's really up to you what your cells are to you. But I will say to that point <laughs> that everybody's cells and everybody's incubator are probably very unique because they're not really in their physiological setting, right? A true EC, even in the tips of your fingers, is different from that in the tips of your toes. So it's hard to define. This is, we need to be more pluralistic, just like in society. We need to be open to all types. And I admire you calling your cardiac ECs, if that's what you want to call them, ECs. But don't call them ECs just by virtue of CD31, my friend. Look deeply into them. And I think, again, just getting serious for a second, it's why this paper was so impressive to echo your point is because it's not just a bunch of single cell seek plots where you put two things next to each other and you look at a principal component analysis and you say this looks a lot like this relative to this which is a fibroblast like these are ecs because they're in the vascular bed in a liver you know mm -hmm. contributing to the sinusoid secreting factor eight they're 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 it, it looks like an ec it quacks like an ec it secretes like an ec so <laughs> these are ecs i think that uh deserve a bit more attention cool well that makes me feel a little bit better i guess <laughs> ecs are ecs well depends on who you ask i guess right don't ask the ec guy this is the ec guy anyways 
moving on to a model system that we don't talk about a whole lot here on the podcast, and that's the fly, Drosophila. Fitness trade-offs incurred by ovary to gut steroid signaling in Drosophila. First author here is Sarah Mahmood, and last author is Bruce Edgar. This is a paper in Nature. It actually came out very recently, uh, you know, based on the recording of this podcast, and it's coming from the German Cancer Research Center over there in Heidelberg, Germany. Now, we're stem cell biologists here on the podcast, and if you're listening to this, you're probably a stem cell biologist, and the Drosophila maybe doesn't get as much love because it's not as sexy of a model system as, say, the IPSC that we're all working on, but when it comes to actually genetic screening and looking at molecular insights in a really scalable in vivo system, you can't beat the Drosophila, right? I mean, there's so many pathways that are conserved between even the fruit fly and, and humans as well. And that's something that they were looking at here when it comes to the impact of the sex hormones on a non-reproductive um, system. So the general premise of the paper here is that they're figuring out how a steroidal sex hormone called ecdysone was actually in uh, affecting the intestinal stem cell population in female fruit flies and actually causing the intestine, uh, intestinal stem cells to grow in size and induce other changes as well. And uh, I, th I thought it was really neat because you've got the effect of a completely – two completely independent systems, the reproductive system and the, uh, the gastrointestinal system, and you're looking at their, their cross impact. And it's thought that maybe this ecdysone is inducing intestinal stem cell proliferation. And not only that, that might be a reason why uh, the female fruit flies have a higher capacity to develop actually tumors in their intestinal uh, cells. Because uh, beyond the context of reproduction, the, this particular hormone may hyperactivate cell, cell signaling and stem cell division leading to that oncogenic phenotype. Of course, you got to frame this all in the context of the fact that uh, you know humans don't have this particular hormone, ecdysone, but we have other hormones, obviously, right? We have testosterone, we have you know, estrogen, and perhaps and, and there is a lot of literature out there showing how sex hormones can impact non-reproductive systems. So I think this is a really great model system that's can be used to study exactly that, that cross interaction between different bodily systems in a very scalable context. So don't hate on the fruit fly day long. I'm telling you, <laughs> it's a powerful system. Well, I hate on the fruit flies that are in my kitchen, but I don't hate about it. And the ones that are in the vivarium, all about it. Um, this is, yeah, it's, I love stories like this too, because you go basic and you come out with a, just like a, a tenet or a principle that makes sense. You know, teleologically speaking, I can see why there's a link between the gut and the reproductive axis, specifically in women, it makes sense, right? Um, you know, those two, two things are related, reproduction and ingestion. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I like to see how those models, I would like to see how, how they relate to higher, I don't want to say higher, but uh, mammals uh, and specifically humans. I, I'm sure, even though that we don't have ectosone, I'm sure that either by conversion or in parallel, there's some kind of evolution of a link between our reproductive axes and and uh, food intake, you know, it, it just makes sense. So I would expect to see that, although I don't know if these fly guys are ready, but I do work in a reproductive lab. So if you want to collaborate, you can do most of the work and have most of the insight, and I'll put my name on the paper. <laughs> so practical, Dale, so practical. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, w I used to be a fly guy back in the day, you know, full, full disclosure here. Ten years ago, actually, uh, my favorite class in undergrad at Duke University, go Blue Devils, was uh, a developmental biology course using fruit flies to examine um, different mechanisms, different genes that are mutated and cause defects in fly development. And I thought it was perfect for the context of an undergrad class because, because fruit flies develop so quickly, so rapidly in the course of days, you can actually condense your experiments down to the course of a semester, which, which is perfect for, for school, right? You can go from the inception of a project saying, I want to tar target this gene to actually looking at the phenotypic consequences. And I thought that's why that class really stuck with me because I was like, wow, even in the course of, you know, this little pseudo, you know, developmental biology, uh, experiment, 
I, I can really go from project inception to phenotype. Um, so again, I got to emphasize, don't hate on the fruit fly. You got it, Dale? <laughs> I don't, I swear. You know, I started in the frog and it just occurs to me, these, these developmental models where it's soup to nuts in 24 to 36 hours are probably specifically tuned to the undergraduate and graduate school attention span because that's, I mean, that's <laughs> what it takes really to keep them invested. And it works because it brought me yeah. into human embryonic and pluripotent stem cells. So I'm grateful to all those lower organisms, the fly and the frog, but I got to bring it back up. I don't want to say up. I got to bring it back over to the human um, because, you know, we talk about stem cells here and the end game is clinical application. I have a story here that is part of a, a massive effort, I think, um, by many groups in Shanghai. I'm just going to read the senior authors here. It's Wei Feng Yu, Bo Zai, and He Jing Yan um, at uh, Shanghai there, as I said. And this is a story about these uh, bio-artificial liver, okay? So just, you know, our acute liver failure, it's a big deal, mostly because of mortality. When you suffer from acute liver failure, we're talking about, you know, aspirin overdose, anything like that, alcohol, of course. Um, it's 80% mortality, so it's a really big deal. And you need intervention there that's, like, supportive, right? You need something that's not a liver transplant because you're not going to get a liver transplant in the acute phase. So there's a kind of, like, bridge therapies such as bio-artificial livers that are designed to detoxify the blood and thereby bridge the gap to liver transplantation and also maybe like give the liver a break in terms of function so that it can regenerate. You know, the liver is tremendously regenerative. So it's not just about, um, you know, transplant, but just some patients who might be at a critical threshold where they would die. Um, you could give them a the little support from bioartificial liver and maybe their own liver will come back and then they, they survive. So there's been a lot of approaches for that. A lot of like, there's a cell line, this hepatoblastoma cell line that's been used, but it doesn't have all the hepatic function. There's these like induced um, hepatocytes from fetal fibroblasts, but the process for making them is really cumbersome. So you can't get a lot of them high quality and, you know, quality controlled and consistent. Um, and then there's porcine hepatoblasts that are really good and in ready supply. You know, we love our pork, but, um, and they're functional. They're just like human parasites, but obviously there's a kind of like a xenozoonosis idea and also immunological barriers that make it tough to apply those, right? So this group, um, and I don't know who amongst them, but it was a lot of them, but they'd previously shown that they could make mouse and human primary hepatocytes into these expandable hepatocyte-like hepatocyte progenitors that were like interconvertible between progenitor and hepatocyte fate through chemical reprogramming. And, and here they just apply that essentially. I don't want to say just because it's a big deal. They, they developed this um, macroporous carrier in an air-liquid interactive bio-artificial liver. So it's this interface device. Um, it's, a, it's a device with an air-liquid interface where they seed these induced hepatocytes um, and they grow into this 3D matrix, and it's great. Uh, and the functional thing is really it. They, they have this acute liver failure model in pigs where they give them a drug overdose, and then they, in a randomized fashion, uh, N equals 6 in each group randomized, they put these extracorporeal, they call them ALI BAL, so air liquid interface, bioartificial liver, ALI BAL, treatment um, for three hours, and it prevented hepatic encephalopathy. It led to markedly improved survival. 83% of them survived as opposed to 17%. So that was five out of six survivors versus one out of six survived in the control that got just the device with no cells. So it's a big deal. They did a lot of measurements, blood ammonia, all that. They showed that it worked. They showed that it saved these pigs' lives in the acute sense. So like, I don't know what's left to do here. This is like, again, extracorporeal. There's no risk. This is just a bridge device to get you to, you know, through that, you know, catastrophic phase. So it's, a, it's an amazing piece of work. And, you know, this being China, I think that they're really advanced in maybe taking this into clinical trials. So I would expect to see the, a lot of movement on these bioartificial livers as a kind of intermediate step towards these engraftable. You know, we talk about like the vi like all these other um, function, like for pancreatic islets and stuff. And there's also like implantable liver 
um, hepatocytes that have been proposed for that idea. But I think these extracorporeal is a really neat idea that works. We're saving lives out here. We're saving pig lives. We're saving <laughs> Drosophila lives. We're saving, we saved a lot of lives when it comes to model organisms. But ultimately, like you said, the goal is to save human lives. And this is in science translational medicine for a reason. It's, uh, this is, you know, you got to respect a large animal study like this because this is not cheap. It is pricey to do not only like non-human primates, but porcine models as well. Like if you can think about some of Chuck Murray's work using iPS cardiomyocytes and injecting them into the heart to see engraftment, that's that's not cheap stuff. So props to these folks. Now this is uh, looking at primary hepatocytes that were sort of pseudo, pseudo immortalized, not iPSCs. I thought their their scaffolding based approach was really neat. I was looking at a a commentary on the paper showing how this thing actually you know contracts and almost like breathes in mm. a way to serve as like a pseudo dialysis machine or something for failing livers. One question I did have was this this was focused on drug induced liver failure, right? And uh, this is only that's that's only one form of liver failure. I mean, the thought is maybe you could apply this to other forms of, of failure as well, right? Is that kind of the, the understandable next approach? Yeah. I mean, I guess the, 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 you know, a huge target there is a chronic liver failure. That's probably the majority of the unmet need in the, in the liver space is, you know, chronic liver failure down, downstream alcoholism or other um, exposure. And I, I would imagine that it would provide the same function. I think though that the critical thing to look at here is the time scale. You know, they were looking at this Alibal treatment for three hours, right? Yeah. And I think three hours is, this is what you talk about. When you talk about a hepatologist, that's what they're like. They come in in the ER and they're going to die or they're not going to die. And this is like an equivalent or, or an extension of dialysis, as you were alluding to. So I think the problem with chronic is obviously, you know, if it's a matter of weeks, maybe. I don't know if the Alibal is going to stand up for that long a time. But, um, you know, as you said at the beginning of your comment there, we're saving lives. Maybe right now saving lives in the acute phase may be it. But you can imagine that there's all kinds of other cell types you said also this is fox a3 that they use to kind of immortalize as you said these maybe there's other cell types that have more longevity maybe there's others that are like pseudo implantable that could exploit the same scaffold so yes saving lives one little bit at a time i'll take it with the acute liver failure you know i could go out drinking now hard and just have my boy on the line over there hey he's in young I'm going to give you a call, bro. So <laughs> on that note, you know, we're talking about saving lives. We're talking about pluripotent stem cells. Most of the time, these were progenitors. I got a message from Stem Cell Technologies. You can take your human pluripotent stem cell cultures further with MTZER Plus from Stem Cell Technologies, the most widely published medium for feeder-free human ES and IPS cell maintenance. It's now formulated for enhanced performance and versatility. MTZER Plus reduces medium acidosis for more stable cultures all weekend long. To learn more, visit www.stemcell.com slash mteaserplus. Now, without any further ado, let's get on to the interview with someone I truly admire, Dr. Valentina Greco. Okay, guys, today for this episode, we have with us the special pleasure of welcoming Dr. Valentina Greco who is the Carolyn Walsh Slayman Professor of Genetics at Yale University. Dr. Greco's lab has developed novel live imaging approaches, allowing them to study the complex orchestration of tissue, tissue regeneration using the skin as a model system. Valentina, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, Dr. Greco, your lab focuses on the role of stem cells in organ regeneration using the skin as a model system. And you've also produced some data suggesting that the regeneration of hair follicles can serve as a protective factor against tumor growth, which is actually published recently in a JCB article. So the data also shed some light on the regenerative capacity of some cancers. So talk a little bit more about this work. And is this suppression of oncogenic growth something that might be harnessed to preemptively fight skin cancer in the future, like in the form of a, a tumor vaccine, for example. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So it's a fascinating area for us because we tend to think very much about the homostatic side 
of our tissue, how can they function over time and, and do it that over and over again every single day of our lives. And so we are most fascinated why we don't develop cancer than when we do. Um, and so that work was inspiring to us because in many of the behavioral and molecular dissection, we understood that the wild type cells have a sentinel job to do as we have oncogenic mutation in neighboring cells. And what we realize is that their proliferative ability of these wild type epithelial cells is actually a strong mechanism for protection, so much that in recent data we can even leverage it as a defense. And so what it made us think is when we treat cancer, we tend to suppress the proliferative capacity. Uh, we tend to think it as a hallmark of the cancer, but in tissue that are highly regenerative like the skin, is also the hallmark of the homeostatic capacity, the self-defense, and many other angles that if we were to leverage, could, for instance, a properly iterative uh, approach may be one way to uh, pattern with the cells within the tissue in order to, say, eliminate cancer. Um, it's a bit of an erratic idea, but certainly uh, something that we think a lot about. Yeah, a lot of people think about the skin. Skin's big. You know, we just came from the ISSCR 2020. And I mean, I'm very fond of the skin, specifically my own skin. And, you know, all joking aside, my mother had a, a tragic burns and she's fine now. But like it, it was a long recovery with skin grafts. And, you know, and I know also there's a lot of other indications um, for the skin. But I've always kind of thought in spite of all that. Um, that skin hair kind of gets a disproportionate level of attention in these stem cell biology focused conferences relative to like the visibility and the prominence of the clinical demand, you know, in the popular media, at least. I mean, we know, we hear about the heart, cardiomyocytes, Arun will tell you cardiomyocytes <laughs> are going to save the world, right? But like, you know, the skin, it's not as visible in terms of the unmet clinical need, but you see it a lot at the conferences. Tell me and the listeners what we should know about the clinical applications of skin, hair, stem cells, and also why are some of the greatest stem cell biologists alive today working in the skin? Yeah. So I think one of the reasons why, for instance, clinically we pay attention to other organs is because it must be really um, unsettling to deal with organs that you cannot directly monitor and then all of a sudden discover they are affected by disease that could have been prevented. In skin, we tend to have the ability to see it maybe ahead of time and intervene. Um, that doesn't mean that, for instance, we were always able to cure melanoma that we could see, right? So it used to be a really fatal type of disease. Um, so it's an interesting question from clinical application and it's true as reviewers, we tend to also think about cancers that we cannot cure and we cannot remove uh, much more uh, with much more pressure, with much more urgency. At the same time, I think skin offers an opportunity that is unique, because in therapy as well as in longitudinal tracking of any diseases, including cancer, you can actually do that. For instance, with microscopy or even just the gross observation. So think about the, all the opportunities of you to understand the disease in all these stages and just uh, even manipulate it um, in ways that is uh, uh, capable of maintaining the organism alive. Um, in terms of uh, landscape, we profit from an incredible community. Um, the skin graft that you were referring to, for instance, for your mom, they're based on much earlier work done by Howard Green at MIT that was capable of uh, uh, you know, bridging this frontier where we could take these cells from the skin, this keratinocyte, and create a graft so that then we can implant back. Recently, there is work from Carl Kerr, for instance, that can now even create appendages within the skin. And so you can sweat again, perhaps. You can have hair again, not only just this cover, this barrier. Um, but there are also work, for instance, in the cornea by Graziella Pellegrini and Michele De Luca that are incredible. They can intervene and cure blindness in this epithelium that is also external as the skin that we touch uh, for a regenerative cure that are stem cell driven and they are in the clinic. Um, so the field is very embracing, uh, fascinating, and is populated by incredible uh, uh, people and pillars. You know, just to make a few names, Sarah Miller, for instance, the director of the Institute of Stem Cells at Monsane, um, George Cozzarelli, Kathy Green, Elaine Fuchs, Fiona Water. This is a community of giants that have a built an understanding and an investment on this tissue that you're referring to, because you can see now at major conferences, and allowing many more investigators to come and join. 
Yeah, there's certainly tremendous biologists and tremendous researchers focused on the skin. You mentioned Elaine Fuchs, and you also talked a little bit about the visibility of the skin in your in your answer there. Uh, you know, you can very easily see the manifestations of skin diseases as opposed to other diseases like cardiovascular, where you have to kind of indirectly look sometimes. And uh, when you're talking about imaging, you know, your lab has actually developed a lot of tools that integrate imaging of the skin and stem cells in their niche with uh, with live mice and genetics and also uh, biological approaches. So all these things can allow you to better understand tissue regeneration just by visually examining how these processes unfold, right? So imaging tech has really advanced like crazy in the last decade. And we were actually just talking to Christy Red Horse at the ICCR meeting about using ultra high resolution light, light sheet microscopy to actually examine heart development. But so in your example, talk a little bit more about how these imaging approaches, these new imaging approaches have really improved our understanding of skin regeneration and how you can actually use them uh, to their full advantage. Yeah, so this is really attributed to, to the field of developmental biology. Um, if you look at that landscape for decades, they've been using microscopy to interrogate uh, live animals, live organisms. And I happen to actually have trained uh, in the PhD as a PhD with uh, Susan Eaton, who is one of the uh, of the people, the pioneer also the developmental cell biology merging by using Drosophila. Um, I've come to learn from her the passion for microscopy. And after studying my postdoc skin uh, regeneration, um, when I started in my lab, I started this high risk, uh, high impact approach on the side. The, I didn't know whether it would work, which was can we start to explore skin with the two photo microscopy, which can go deep down. And it's really the fruit of a collaboration with an incredible intravital imaging facility that we have at Yale, as well as a, a postdoc, Padelis from Polis, the uh, Joy Malab and Peggy Mung and many others that together collaboratively have a law for the field to start to interrogate uh, in longitudinal manner and with cell biology resolution, um, how are our tissue organizing and the rumble principle in order for, for it to survive uh, and withstand the everyday tear and function. Yeah, we talk about technology, and I think one thing you realize really quickly when you're on your own is that, I, I mean, as a PI, is that, or even as a postdoc, yeah, as soon as you get into science nowadays, um, you realize that innovation is, is driven in large part by integration of new tech, right? Um, and a lot of times that can be expensive, right? Uh, Christy was telling us, like uh, Arun said, how she has her own. She started with her own con confocal in her startup, and now she has her own light sheet. Uh, and I know a major pillar of your research is novel applications, the two photon that you were just referring to. Although you said, you know, use a core, um, it's still expensive, uh, you know, just access. And we're becoming more aware in how, in our society, how wide the chasm is an opportunity, you know, socially, societally. Do you think there's an element of that in science where it's not so much that like the rich get richer, but it's like kind of like the, the smart get smarter, you know, you get the big innovative results, you get the big paper, you get the funding, you get the equipment and instruments or access, you get the next result, you get the funding and so on and so forth. What do you think about that? I think it's a very... Um important point that you brought up and there is a lot of, of uh, societal and only scientific framework that goes into who goes forward and who doesn't. I consider myself extremely privileged and I felt in my career that I've been on both sides, loser and winner, and very much that was due to the environment I was into, the resources I had access, access to and the sponsorship I had. So what you said is very dear to me, because if you take just the two photon uh, and say, if we think the science should be done that way across the board, what we are speaking about is a piece of equipment that is easily 600K. And so one conversation I had uh, uh, with the NIH and program officer is, can we centralize within university and have ways where we can uh, even have core facilities that can uh, prepare samples or do imaging for labs in ways that are subsidized centrally from the university. Otherwise, it will become, as you said, an opportunity of a privilege. A person like me that has managed to do it thanks to the support and investment that others have done on me, but not something that is uh, as open or as accessible to others. Even in our efforts to help colleagues um, 
with collaboration or even just investment on them. It requires a huge investment of time and uh, education and knowledge um, for it to be a long-term investment. Um, and there is so much depth that can be captured from it. So the more we dig in, the more there is to dig. And so I've been thinking a lot about how can we do that collaborative in a way that helps everybody to thrive. Nobody tries to overlap with each other, but in ways that, as you said, could be truly accessible to others. And uh, unfortunately, I think uh, is a, a model against the framework of which we do science. Mm -hmm. We tend to reinforce uh, individuals. We don't think about groups. Mm -hmm. um, and those individuals tend to have, uh, the more you go up, uh, very narrow characteristics. So equality in science certainly extends beyond financial equality as well. And you've, of course, been a fierce advocate of racial and gender equality and diversity in science. And you're deeply in involved with multiple uh, committees, including the Committee on the Status of Women in Medicine at Yale. And you've been quoted as saying that you want your lab to be free from the codes that society gives for determining talent. And I'm a big fan of that. As somebody who actually aspires to be a PI one day, could you tell me a little bit more about your approach to actively shaping a diverse lab and uh, making sure everybody feels welcome in a lab where ideas can really come from anyone. So I hope you will take the next statement uh, um, with the uh, wholly heartily as I intended. Um, if I really want to create a safe space for learning and uh, for growth and ownership for all of us, uh, especially my most vulnerable members in my lab, I need to start from a place where I admit to myself I'm racist, I'm sexist, I'm classist, and so on and so forth. And it's very hard to, in all conversation, to always say, if somebody's in distress, what have I done that contributes to that? What, what have I contributed that actually this person is telling me is about me doing something wrong? It's hard, it's a bit taxing at times, but I don't know any other way to live a, a purposeful life. Um, I just feel um, that again, I've been in this journey um, thinking very deeply what is the structure even of our education, of the way school asks us to all form into one group of where there is a, a need to stay within pattern and never break it, but then the breaking of those patterns get celebrated. There are so many mixed messages. There is so um, unequal access and there is uh, so much um, that lack of time to all of us will simply legitimize the racism, the sexism, etc. that we have. COVID is such an example, right? I have seen uh, a trainees that I adore uh, enduring just because of a, um, Asian inheritance, uh, uh, discrimination and racism as if they have anything to do with it, right? And uh, the reason why people feel free to do it is because in moments of stress and when you don't have time, you connect to your biases and your action will reflect that, legitimizing all this uh, brainwashing that we received effectively since we are born. Um, so I found that the only formula, I'm a person that tends to want to rush, to have actions and get done with the things and the education I do every day on myself, which costs me a lot. And I tell my lab members, this is me, let's counteract it, is just ask myself to take time. Whenever I'm doing things that are important, which is essentially every single time I speak with them, I do something with them. Can I uh, take time to do it right? Because if I, whenever we say to each other, follow your gut, that's the most dangerous things we are telling each other to do. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I, I really admired also, uh, I checked in on the women's panel, uh, the women in science panel that was led by Christy Mummery at the ISSCR. And I thought she made a great point, which was like, come on guys, open your eyes. Like we could talk all we want, but you go to these conferences, you walk in the halls, like, do you see a lot of black faces? Do you see a lot of people of color? This is us, this is our system and we've got to like fight to change it. I really appreciate that. And I thought you too did a great job at ISSCR across the board. Um, and you're a real ambassador for stem cell biology, strong advocate for science, social justice. But um, yes, that, it's a big part of what draws your, your, your trainees to your lab, right? Um, but I should tell you, you should know that whenever your name comes up in discussion, when I'm talking to anybody, somebody says, oh man, she's so cool. And that's new, I think. I think that's new in science. Uh, there's always been this archetype of the eccentric scientists, you know, see Einstein or Tesla. But recently, there's this new 
uh, archetype, I think, of like a science celebrity who has tinted hair and showcases her tech fluency by navigating the ISSCR virtual panels with effortless grace and propel citizen protests on Twitter and all that. I'm talking about you, Valentina. Is this just your path? Uh, or do you think that this is kind of a shift in the societal role and responsibility for science and, and scientists? So, of course, you struck my ego. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but, you know, one thing that I really suffer about is... Um, we as people tell each other a narrative where we need to have the single individual. Is the protagonist he or she? Maybe in the future will be she mostly is he. And we know that. And this protagonist is the genius, is the visionary. We have all the code words, right? Brilliant, blah blah blah. I dream of a world that can come up with a narrative. I've been working at it. That is we. If today is about James, Arun, and Valentina. Well, if there is a way for us to think how the collective is more powerful. Like when I even watch superhero um, movies, I'm also excited when, you know, um, you see uh, movies that represent many more people than just white men as superheroes. But then I left it with unsatisfaction because they always portray violent superheroes. Mm. I don't believe, for instance, violence. I believe in um, empathy. That's my superhero. Uh, skill, and something that I would love for all of us to do. I believe in a group. One of the reasons why I love my uh, the things we do in my group and group in general is because very early on in my life, I've experienced the power of groups in amplifying positive and dampening negative. And the endorphin release I experience in laughing together with uh, three, four, seven people together, sharing an experience, that was so powerful. And that's actually what fits me every day. How can we create a narrative where there is no any more single individual? Because I'm not special. Development of biology has created an understanding that I have leverage, but what I do is development of biology. You transplant me in stem cells, we don't see much of that, but I'm one of the others in development of biology. Why don't we speak about waves, groups? Maybe some people will be more at the edges. There are some people that are interested in intergroup relationship, right? People that bridges fields. But even in the way we award with prizes and awards, um, there is even a resistance to say second place or third place, mm -hmm. as if there has to be a single person. Um, the more we propagate that and the more we come out from this conversation, say Valentina is special, the more we are reinforcing that. How can we come out and say, what is a thinking that can create a much more collective support that we all buy into and we take turns? I totally agree with that. And something that you said there really resonated with me in that, you know, sharing an experience is really some of the most, it's one of the most important things you can do in science is share your experiences and your successes with other people. Because at least to me, that's, you know, that that's how I find happiness in the science is, you know, I get to share the work that I do, not with only with the general audience, like a general non-scientific or a scientific audience, but also my PI, my who might be excited about the work that I do, or my student who might be very excited about the work that I do. So that's I completely agree with you on that. Um, when it comes to individual awards, and I think we certainly do have a lot of work to share the wealth that we've, you know, like we've been talking about here. Um, certain singular awards are awarded to people whereby, you know, everybody assumes that that person is a genius or that person is so responsible for the the success of the lab. When in, in reality, it's a group effort, of course. It's the lab is, you know, not just one individual, it's a shared experience. Um, and you were actually the recipient of the NIH's Pioneer Award, which is, of course, like we were talking about, a singular award. But, you know, as a PI who has received such a prestigious honor, how do you best ensure that that honor is shared amongst the scientists in your laboratory? And um, how can you ensure that, that the funding and the resources that come with that award can better the careers of your, your trainees? And uh, does it also give you a little bit more freedom to do things that you want to do? Absolutely. So I think one thing I wanted to do to expand first on what you just said, which I appreciate very much, is that essentially we have to always deal with that tension between individual and collective. In other words, 
right now, if we were to speak, the three of us all together, we would not understand each other. So I need to take my turn to speak. But then how do we both allow individual growth as well as collective is where we want to um, really take a stand. And my push towards collective is because ultimately there is no way to eliminate individual. If I'm alive, I have a, a identity and a, and a soul that I want to continue to perpetuate. So of course I'm going to fit into my individuality but the collective doesn't get praised as much. So with respect to the DP1 pioneer, for instance, one thing that I do routinely is share my grant with anybody that approaches me, even colleagues that I don't know of that I just simply want um, for them to succeed. And just to make sure that, you know, my ethos, I've done that also with grants that I have not yet submitted. For instance, I'm uh, submitting this grant for an HHMI competition and I share the grant that is already finished to multiple colleagues. I just think that there is room for us to all make the contribution by inspiring each other. And we all have stories that are different. Lived experience due to characteristic I have. I'm an immigrant, I'm a boomer, I'm white. What can I propose through the lenses of my appraising that my science will um, breathe through? Um, and the DP1 Pioneer was a, a, a great experience for me because as for any grant I do, in fact, for anything I do in my life, um, in the professional life, we is a shared experience. So we came together with a couple of people in our lab and we started to brainstorm, throw an idea, and build on uh, an area that uh, was really start from scratch from um, uh, students in my lab and the wonderful physician scientist, um, Peggy Myung, that we started to tackle this idea of how normal tissue interacts with mutation. And then DB1, one of the ideas that we are really enamored is how do we think about all the mutant cells that we have in our tissues that seem to coexist in an equilibrium? We tend to think about competition at all times, also in primitive biosocial framework. But it seems to me that this observation, actually, they might say that these mutations may co be cooperative and who knows, maybe even helping on the stasis of the tissue. So it's a different way, different lens to look at it. Um, and we are collaborating through this grant with uh, many people that are better than us on things we cannot do, like molecular sensors. Um, or this is the work of Dr. Uh, Sergi Rago, John Hopkins, that will together will allow this type of development. Or Jan Belash, an incredible applied biologist, uh, Institute Curie, that they can think about cell geometry and tissue interactions. Um, also, Maria Casper is part of this grant, who is an incredible single cell sequencing in the field of skin. Um, so I think I've been extremely privileged and fortunate, and uh, I've been using it to grow together with my lab members to share whatever we put together that seemed to have worked, and to create collaboration that we hope will advance the science as we had planned for. That is so meta. Your, you, your philosophy is to work together and to share and you have a collaborative grant that is focused on rather than competition between cells, collaboration between cells. I mean, it's like all walks of life, uh, you're, you're shifting the whole paradigm there. But, um, you know, this was part of your, your experience, I'm sure shaped you into who you are. So I wanna dip a little bit into that. I did my postdoctor, I did my graduate training um, at Rockefeller where you did your postdoc. I was in Ali Brivanlu's lab, which is, I think in the same building as Fuchs at that point. Um, but of course, I'm guessing that was a formative years for you. She's a giant, a pillar, as you said. Uh, and you're in good company among the many, many stars who've shot out of Fuchs Lab. Um, so for a, you know, a postdoc or grad student who's listening to this, uh, you talk about you know, the interrelationship of the group and the PI. Um, what, what do you think, given your experience, is a mentor's, a good mentor's uh, responsibility to their trainee? And what does the trainee need to bring to the table? I mean, we all know, just to be more specific, we all know that good luck, bad luck, it's, it's a factor in science, you know? Sometimes careers are made just by a lucky stroke or, you know, opportunities lost. Um, but, you know, overall, how can you iron that out? How can the mentor-trainee relationship transcend that kind of the vicissitudes of good or bad fortune and just, you know, hard, good science prevailing. What, what's your advice on that front? Yeah, so you find me very thoughtful about that. Uh, in my path, I've learned that we don't put so much emphasis on the process, but on the outcome. 
And what we think about lack, I have the audacity to say that is also poor management. <laughs> uh, maybe not on the trainee side, but certainly on the faculty side. So I'm taking full responsibility as a faculty to now understand um, how do you actually come to ask questions in the right way that no matter of the outcome, you're going to be able to publish that work. How do you shift to the focus on the scientists, not on the science? So that the science is going to be really spectacular. Mm. Um, I had conversation with colleagues and friends I love very much. That, for instance, they kept saying, in my lab retreat, I want really to have creative science. And we struggle a lot about this idea of how do you foster creativity? How do you do creative science? And, and for me, I was stuck always on the same question. Who does the science? The scientists. But in science, we tend to say, you know, there's this piece of data is an objective piece of data that is either outstanding or not. Uh, to me, it's all about how you look at it and who looks at it. And uh, we are so much in a narrative that speaks about single individual, but when it comes to your labs, individuals seem to disappear. I tend to think that's not correct and it's hypocrite. And it is about the fact that we don't reward management at the faculty level. We reward outcome, regular work products, the millions I bring you, the indirect I give you, the nature science science so that you will, as a power place in the institution can say that you have good scientists, but it is not on me managing my lab and the individuals within it. So all of this led for me to come up with a process by which I have many um, infrastructure. One of them is six months review where we have a series of questions that dig in into aspiration, uh, communication between me and the lab members, lab culture, scientific approach. And the, uh, we ask the lab members to fill them up and me reading it and taking time to absorb it and then having four hours meeting, not during COVID because that would be suicidal. During COVID, <laughs> we are coming up with a split system. But it used to be in my office with coffee, chocolate, tea, whatever they wanted to have or taking a walk and have an in-depth every six months conversation about um, who are we, where do we want to go, what are our goals. Um, people tend to think that this is a lot of time. I would say that this actually is almost like a way to lubricate our soul, right? figuring out where are the contractions, how to release them, and how to make sure I'm so centered on my own fit that I can use my body, my chemistry, my soul to really give the best to something that brings us together, the passion we have for science. But it is about me, me lab member, me student, me tech, me postgraduate, right? It's about centering them and figuring out that they feel empowered, safe, and capable of growing. And then the creative science comes. Hmm. Wow, that's that's incredible. And I, I totally agree with you. I think that's the right way to do things. If somebody feels safe in the environment that they're actually able to do the science in, then I think inevitably the quality of that science will will accelerate and be be great. So I totally agree with you. And I think that's the right way to do things. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Greco. And before we let you go, uh, we're going to ask you a couple of peripheral questions just so that our listeners can get to know you a little bit better. So first off, what non-science book are you reading or that you've read recently that's great and that you really want to share with our listeners? Uh, I'm in the middle of reading Why Fragility. Um, and uh, we also have started a lot of uh, conversation in my lab uh, in a Slack channel. We tend to communicate through Slack with inclusive academia. Um, it's very humbling, it's heartbreaking, and uh, it's really committed me to um, self-scrutiny of what I'm doing that contributes to a racist framework. Um, and I welcome the exercise uh, with the pain and everything, because I really would like to change uh, much of what I do and uh, help uh, everyone around me uh, to do better by each other. Yes, this is should be required reading for anyone who's part of the institution that we live in, right? Because uh, like you said earlier, if you're not fighting it, you're a part of it. Um, so yeah, recommend that. My wife has really been bending my ear about it and got me to read it too. And it really is a revelation. Even for someone with a, a father who's black, I realize how much white privilege I've had in my life. Um, anyway, moving on to the last uh, peripheral question here. You've had so many, but share with us one of your more prominent so-called aha moments or a science revelation that was a surprise, a disappointment, anything along those lines, please. 
Um, yeah, there were a couple of moments that uh, um, we remember fondly with the lab. Um, I remember one when uh, uh, Samara was um, doing these projects on uh, um, giving this oncogenic uh, mutation with beta catenin and, and she started to see how she was given it and she was creating growth. Um, and then as she was following this growth, we were sure that they would remain or become worse, but she kept seeing signs that they became smaller. We're really puzzled by that, and Samara came up with the idea of following them even farther. And she realized that um, actually they were gone. The fact that the tissue can uh, create a new steady state in which the, they can create growth, they can be corrected, sentinel by wild type cells, it was really interesting. Similarly, Christy came to my lab to study cancer. She used this HRAS mutation that we always use for cancer. And she looked at these mice, she says, there is a tumor here, but 99% of the skin is not tumor free. What is up with that? And why is it that we don't study that? And so there are a number of these examples, many others, where um, it is really thanks to the foresight of this uh, right scientists in my lab that they come and say, I know there's something that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really indebted for them to follow um, those outliers, those things that don't make sense. And it's a principle that speaks to me because Susan, my PhD mentor, really always advocated for this approach. That's a great illustration, I think, and a, a consolidation of a lot of things you talked about uh, with us today, which is that, yeah, you know, you, you got to have a plan, you got to have a solid approach, but then you also have to have a safe space and you have to be able and encouraged to, to chase down that unexpected little wrinkle, you know, when you have a little gut instinct saying, is something not right here? It's that instinct is kind of the return on your investment in, in really a carefully designed experiment. So I think that's a lesson for all of our, our young scientists and all of our, you know, mature seasoned scientists and some of our errant flailing scientists like myself. So thanks for that. And, and thanks for, for everything. Valentina, I'm a, I'm a huge fan, a huge, a huge admirer of yours. And uh, I think that uh, you really are the best ambassador and advocate for stem cell science, but also just for everything, everything that you talk about, I think you really think deeply about it. And it's a testament to uh, your, your, how, how careful a scientist and, and human you are. So thanks for sharing all that with us. And we hope to have you back again sometime soon. All right, you guys, that brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at Stem Cell Podcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode focusing on the skin, guys. Stay cool out there in this hot summer air, and we'll be back at you with an interim episode next week about the ISSCR 2020. And in a couple weeks, we'll have our next full show. Thanks for joining us.